Welcome to Nothing Ventured with me, Arish Shah. This is the podcast where we explore the people and stories that make up the tech and venture ecosystem. Don't forget to subscribe, like, rate, and share the podcast because it really helps us get the word out to more people who are curious about understanding even more about the world of venture capital. This season of Nothing Ventured is sponsored by Odin. Odin helps angels, VCs, and founders to raise and deploy capital seamlessly. You can structure your SPVs and now run your funds, handle capital calls, portfolio management more smoothly and easily in one place. Founders use Odin to raise their entire round in a few clicks by simply sending investors a link and receiving investments immediately. Odin works with over 5,000 investors and over 150 emerging fund managers and angel syndicates globally. Head to joinodin.com to learn more. That's J-O-I-N-O-D-I-N dot com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Nothing Ventured with me, Ari Shah. Today, I was really excited to have with me in the studio Fatou Diane and Stephanie Heller. Uh, Fatou and Stephanie are the co-founders of Bootstrap Europe, a venture debt fund that provides growth debt to scale up businesses, providing progressive, ambitious entrepreneurs with non-dilutive funding to help them grow. In today's episode, we talked about how a road trip to Mozambique uh, helped them bond and build a friendship and a partnership that hopefully will last a lifetime. Uh, why venture debt is growth funding, not loss funding, why bullet payments don't work with venture debt, and how, as underdogs, Fatou and Stephanie were able to acquire SVB's German debt portfolio. Let's get straight into it. Hello and welcome to another episode of Nothing Venture with me, Ari Shah. Today, I am super excited to have with me in the studio Fatou Diane and Stephanie Heller. Uh, Fatou and Stephanie uh, talked me through a bit of their background, how they got into uh, venture debt uh, in our primary episode. So I do recommend you check it out if you want to learn a little bit more about them. In the meantime, though, Fatou and Stephanie, thank you so much for joining me. It's really a pleasure to have you here in the studio. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice to be here. Amazing. So let's dive straight in. I think we all love a good origin story. I think sadly we live in the world where, you know, that personal story is is almost uh, kind of more intriguing than uh, than the business one. So especially when it comes to co-founders, I think, uh, and yours is a story that goes back actually quite a number of years. I, I'd love for you to share that with us and, and also give me a feel for why you are both so clear that you'd make an awesome team. And I, like having spent a little bit of time with you, you clearly have like a huge amount of chemistry between you. And, and I think it's it's so important to understand, you know, how you how you came to that conclusion and how, how you also make it work, right? Because it, especially having had a long relationship, right? And then going into a business together, that can be challenging, right? Mm -hmm. No, it's very true. You know, we go back a really long time and I'm not going to uh, <laughs> tell you how long because... Uh, <laughs> You know, I don't, don't want to say, no, I don't want to say my age. Decades. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we met when we were, I think, I'm not sure, actually, 17 or yeah. 18 years old. Wow. Uh, and uh, we were boarding at the time. So we were in boarding schools um, in a school called Louis Le Grand in, in Paris, which is, you know, a bit like your equivalent of the, the Cambridge, Oxford. Like, it's like it's been around for like centuries. Mm. Yeah. And uh, and uh, I really vividly vividly remember Fatou actually. And when we she when made I an impression. <laughs> yeah, when I thought, oh, I noticed this person. Like this is Fatou. Like I remember that <laughs> moment. And uh, she was teaching us how to dance. And you might be familiar with this uh, coupe de calais. Yeah. In in the African uh, way of dancing at the time, it's hot in Paris. So yeah, you know. Yeah, so yeah. she was showing us the moves. Uh, so I really remember that moment, actually. It was really, uh, uh, that's nice, funny uh, because I don't remember completely, but obviously you have to play <laughs> up to your strengths. <laughs> yeah. <When> you <laughs> I wasn't going to show the vals movement. <laughs> 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 I don't know yeah, if yeah. people could dance that, I mean, I could, I could ask you to just get up here and, <laughs> and demonstrate. take me to the spin. Maybe, maybe another podcast. Maybe later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe she another might podcast. challenge you, though. Yeah, you yeah. have to. I, I, yeah, I yeah, definitely yeah. not me. Yeah. <laughs> not me, not me. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. so you met in boarding school, but like, there is a, there is a uh, certainly from my experience, right, there is a big difference between having a friendship and really getting on at a personal level and then actually being able to launch a 
business together or get yeah. into business together. So mm -hmm. how, like, how did that journey kind of evolve? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's true that uh, you won't go into business with all your friends. Yeah. You know, you need a <laughs> few things to work. Yeah, and sure. uh, the same way that you say for a couple, a real test is when you travel together oh, and yeah. like you're on a car road trip together. So Stephanie and I have been in quite crazy places mm -hmm. traveling together uh, when we were younger. Mm -hmm. um, What's the craziest place you went to? Uh, it's Mozambique. Yeah, because I think Mozambique. <laughs> Mozambique. Because yeah, fa fair we, enough. We, I think <laughs> we, like we 20, 15 years ago yeah. when there was no Nothing. infrastructure. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. And we, we were four girls, actually. Yeah, in a and truck. In a, in, a, in, a, in a normal car, initially. And they looked <laughs> at us and they said, well, you can't drive a normal car and be safe. To that place, no. So <laughs> they, they gave us for free uh, the rental uh, uh, you know, place, giant this pick up. giant pickup. <laughs> and so we drove and yeah, it was dangerous. We we knew it was dangerous, yeah. I think. And we probably should not have you know, dri driven yeah, on our own. But you're 25 years yeah, old. So we, were, okay. we were 20. Yes, okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Today we wouldn't do so, it. Yeah. But <laughs> so that was fine. But yeah, yeah. there is a couple of, uh, you know, some of the places we went to Brazil or, you know, we're a bit uh, off the beaten track. Yeah. Um, being so sick with uh, dengue uh, in, in the middle Argentina. of Argentina. Yeah, we, we almost died there. <laughs> yeah. sort of. Excellent. I mean, like, if yeah. those are the sort of trials that really tell you how. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm just going to leave you here. Uh, I'm going to head back. Uh, give me a call if anything changes. Uh, so, so, okay, so you kind of, you kind of went through these sort of trials of fire almost, you know, like you're, you're, you're traveling Mozambique. Yes. I mean, much like respect. Mm. Uh, absolutely. Right. You're, you're, you're learning about each other. But then you didn't go straight into business together, right? So because you, you, you then kind of went off different career paths. I mean, you were Correct. working for the UN and, and doing these incredible things in Africa. You're working with a family office in Switzerland. How did, how did you get kind of back? Yeah, well, we always, um, so we've, we, had, we started our careers in 2007. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like what we're experiencing now. Uh, basically, everything went downhill from the moment we started working. Mm -hmm. And finance lost its meaning. Mm -hmm. So to me, it was like we always said, like, this is not why we studied finance. Mm -hmm. um, we need to find something that brings meaning to finance. And clearly, it's if you channel capital into innovation, you get a real impact. Yeah. So we always like, OK, we should do this, we do this, we do this. And um, when you think about the people you can go into business with, people you can trust, uh, there is no... Um, um, how say, there's nothing hurtful in the relationship in mm. the way that if we disagree, we disagree, but you know, mm. it's not that we're going to attack each other on something. Um, we are really quick in decision making mm. uh, and clarifying what are the points to move on. So for me, it wasn't a question when Stephanie called me and said, like, Fatou, I'm thinking of starting this business, you know, would you like to join? I think that was the afternoon I signed my contract with the UN mm. and I said, hmm, well, the UN I think is like part time. So <laughs> coming from investment bank, I can definitely start on something else. Mm -hmm. And if I do it, it's going to be with Stephanie because she's smart, she's efficient. And we had uh, a market yeah, we had to market. do that. Yeah. yeah. And would you say you have like complementary skill sets? Like what do you each bring to the table? Yes, it's true. I mean, we're not exactly the same. I think uh, there is, uh, let's say, uh, F Fatou, Fatou brings this amazing energy. Like she's one of the smartest person I know, so that's why you know the, it, it was going Thank to you. be my, uh, my, my <laughs> first call, you. obviously. <laughs> and um, and I think we uh, let's say we can operate very independently mm -hmm. uh, from each other, and we sort of trust that we will take the right uh, decisions. And where we're different is uh, we don't look at deals, we don't look at anything the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I'm I'm much more like maybe intuitively uh, I would I would have a sense for things to to happen. Fatou is uh, maybe a bit more identical on some some aspect mm. uh, you know you like the legal work more than i do <laughs> or, like so we ha we have so you have like the helicopter yeah. out Sorry. and the details yeah we have uh, yeah we we look yeah. at different different areas within the business and uh fatu's uh, parents are teachers so she's very good at you know uh you know that uh you know, bringing yeah. people up to speed on things and things like this. With the negotiation, she's uh, the best negotiator after Africa. Okay, you, so you I should to talk to you then when, <laughs> when I'm I trying don't know. to raise You don't there. want to be negotiating <laughs> with Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Actually, it's a great yeah, uh, negotiation. Yeah. I, I'll be very creative on, on structures, yeah. on finding solutions to some yeah. of the hard problems yeah. or, you know, uh, identifying things that are really out of the box or things like this. So we, we have a, a yeah. totally different uh, way of operating and as a result, it works well. And also, so our team is extremely diverse. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have very different brains within the team uh, because we like that diversity, I guess. So uh, that came, uh, yeah. That's yeah, how we. I, I think the age the gap in our in our team is like thirty five years. Yeah. 
uh, we have people from with 11 of 14 nationalities in the team. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody brings in a different element of their brain. So when we have looked at a problem as a team, I think there's nothing we have overlooked. Ah, um, and uh, I have to say, with Stephanie, most of the time when we go into negotiation or due diligence, you know, we'll come out, we'll look at each other and we're like, yeah, this thing, without having to say much and, uh, and then implement something afterwards. Yeah, so I guess like for, after for a period addition. of time, you, get, you start to get to understand what the other will think about certain mm -hmm. things and you know, therefore, what to address and what doesn't need to address. Yeah. You, you can get very quickly to where the problems are because exactly. you already know what both of you will both agree on. Uh, and then you can just you can actually tackle those kind of uh, issues and, and move forward. Right. This season of Nothing Ventured is proudly sponsored by Emerge One. Emerge One provides fractional CFO support to venture back tech startups and scale ups. They work with businesses from C to Series B that have been backed by some of the UK, US and Europe's best venture capital funds. They provide support from capital allocation and management, KPIs and reporting, fundraising support, financial modeling, investor relations, and investor management. Come check them out at emergeone.co.uk when you're scaling fast and have need of a CFO. Um, which I think, especially when you're kind of in credit and debt, like it's very important because especially when you're working with startups, they move quickly, right? They can't be waiting three, six months for a decision, which sadly is the case with most debt providers and certainly most legacy debt providers. So actually, let, let's just kind of move on then. So whilst most of our listeners will have a good understanding of venture as an asset class, right? I think venture debt is still not as commonly understood uh, as traditional equity funding, right? So can you give us a quick rundown on where it sits in the capital stack and what are some of the key indicators that businesses uh, might have that, that show that they're ready to consider taking on venture debt and, and, and kind of where do you see the current European uh, ecosystem around venture debt? Because, you know, ha having spoken to a number of providers, there aren't that many, right? And mm. in fact, some of them have closed up shop as we're also going to get to. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a lot of questions in one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's start with the main one. What is venture debt and where does it sit in the capital stack? Maybe the, the, key, uh, the key indicators that you can take venture debt is you have VCs on your cap table, and we, we, we will repeat that uh, again and again. Um, maybe, you know, it's important that the business grow. Mm -hmm. So there is a misconception that you will call a venture debt provider if you can't find equity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the it's reality- not, It's not loss funding, it's growth yes, funding. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so what's fascinating is you always get a no from most of the players, and I would say all of the players, there is no equity on the, you know, uh, yeah. in the business. Usually the debt comes as a complement of a round. And usually when we look at a company, it's because that complement enables the, the company to reach a milestones where its valuation is going to be uh, significantly impacted if we put the financing in. So a good example would be you know, you're a software business, you know uh, your cost of uh, customer acquisition, you know that if you spend 1 million, you get 5 million of uh, annual recurring revenue. You know your 5 million of recurring revenue is going to be valued eight times, 10 times. So you know that by taking 1 million of that, you're increasing your value by, you know, 50. Mm. And mm. so I think this is the sort of business that we want to talk to. Um, and this is the sort of business that, you know, should take the debt. Uh, so it's really the story of growth. Maybe they don't want the valuation or they want to extend the round because they're about to sell their business mm. or they're about to IPO or they're about to acquire uh, a target and it's going to uh, make their growth stories for the next stage. Mm. So this is really a financing that goes into the growth of uh, the business. So, and again, I think this is exactly, this is really important. It's growth funding, it's not loss funding. It is, uh, you know, suitable for businesses that have positive unit economics, that are mm. profitable mm -hmm. on a unit economic level that are showing those growth paths and have a clear pathway to whatever that next milestone is right exactly. whether that is to your point raising an x round or an exit or some MA or whatever it might be yeah. um I do you do you, sorry do you but do you find that do you find that you get approached for for debt funding by people who understand that intuitively or is it for the most part again like oh we haven't been able to raise any venture or we haven't mm. been able to raise the next round we need someone to bridge mm. will you come and bridge or, or do you find that actually yeah the, the, the majority of businesses that come to you understand what it is that they're that, that you offer and and kind of how that works 
Hmm. Yeah, it's, this, uh, it's a loaded question mm, because yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> effectively... That's, that's my job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so you have the ones. you. I think for venture that you'll have the ones who value their equity at not much mm-hmm. and they don't mind adding uh, financial risk mm-hmm. to the business mm-hmm. because what do they have to lose? Got it. Uh, and so those are the ones who will say, well, you know what, I just got put some debt and then maybe that's a gamble that's going to pay. But, you know, if, I, if it doesn't, well, we lose the company. Mm-hmm. And the ones who really, really value their equity mm-hmm. are going to make this calculation and approach us and say, OK, actually, I have we know these milestones. This is what we want to invest the debt is. So the point is though, that uh, we are not we don't have formulas as to who we're going to give the debt to or how much. We do have a lot of criteria. But the, the main question we ask is, why do you want the debt mm-hmm. and why now? Yeah. So if you're able to provide this quest- this answer and you have solid unit economics, you know, uh, solid backers, because at the end of the day, you're loss making. You know, I don't think we have a lot of profitable businesses. Rare. Like, <laughs> it's yeah. rare. Yeah. Um, we want this clarity mm-hmm. uh, and we'll help you get there. Maybe sometimes we'll say, like, it's not mm-hmm. now. It's in six months when you ha- once you have established this or that or or uh, raise some equity, come back mm-hmm. or achieve this milestone and come back. And we try to be constructive in the way we help you get to the venture debt. Uh, but you need to ask yourself very, very serious questions because it sits at the top yeah. of the capital stack. Yeah. We, n- we are participating in the equity somehow, but effectively this needs to be repaid. And a lot of businesses come and say, can you do a bullet? No, it's not bullet. It's, uh, you amortize it a little so bit. So it's capital like, uh, and princi- it's principal and, uh, yeah. and interest. On yeah, yeah, yeah. most of the time of the loan, you will amortize. With zero, with zero potential for conversion or you take options or how no, does that there, work? There is no, uh, no conversion. No conversion. So it is and straight so, debt. And so I debt. think this is why when you take a bullet and you're a business that is loss making, it's problematic. It's a proper bullet. Yeah, yeah. You basically... Uh, you, need to ra- <laughs> you need to raise money to yeah. pay the bullet, right? Like that's yeah. And it, it means in three years, if you don't find the capital to, re- to, to, to be able to reimburse your bullet, you just dead. Yeah. as a business yeah. because mm-hmm. a lot of the VCs or the gross investors they don't want to put the capital to just reimburse the no, debt they, they again also want to fund growth right so they're not right, there absolutely. they're not there to fund existing liabilities no, right? right and you can imagine in the so it's a fascinating question you're asking in the existing uh, economic downturn for the startups because they will be looking for any sort of investments mm. whether it's debt whether it's equity if they're desperate uh, so, you know, some of the company we see, all the VCCs as well, it's, mm. it's not, yep. you know, uh, but uh, yeah, so, you know, our job is to make sure that we don't put the debt in companies when it's too risky for them to take the debt. Um, so it's also our responsibility to, uh, to underwrite correctly. And I think this is, I mean, there, like there, I have so many, <laughs> so, <laughs> I have so many feelings and questions. Uh, but so one, so one of the pro, like one of the problems I see that has been created in the kind of zero interest rate phenomenon period that we've been mm-hmm. in in the last five six years is like the emergence of say revenue based financing, mm-hmm. right? Which kind of weirdly has a sim or is sold as having a similar profile to venture debt, right? But I don't understand, but but most founders didn't understand that it is a, a real an interest bear, yeah an interest bearing product with a real cost to their business, because the diligence mm. is so much lighter, right? Like the diligence is hook in your zero, uh, we'll have a look at your revenue profile and we'll lend you money off the back of that. And and in fact, some of them, I remember Cap Cap I think um, not Cap Chase, sorry, but um, and Cap Clear Bank, no, Clear so Bank? Clear Co. Clear I think originally Clear. when when one of my clients when we first took out the debt with them. Um, going back probably 2017 18 they actually specifically said this is not a debt product right this is okay. this is it, it is not classed as a debt product um and you're like well okay what is it a revenue advance right so they're, they're essentially right and, and then of course i i had founders asking me well okay does that mean we can book this as revenue i'm like no 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 <laughs> it definitely doesn't mean you can book it as revenue. but 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 this is the problem right because founders creative accounting creative yes. accounting 101 like, <laughs> it's like of, uh, yeah it's it's almost like we works a bit dark community adjusted wi- a bit dark the the <laughs> <laughs> the problem, like as a CFO, and obviously when we talk to founders, like we understand this, but a lot of founders don't intuitively Engage, get it because they're not, you know, they're not in that that's not world. Their, yeah. They're product focused or they're, you know, they're subject matter experts and so on. So who do you deal with actually? Are you are you typically dealing with the VCs? Are you dealing with the founders? Are you dealing with their CFOs? Uh, who, who, are, who are the people that come looking for, or brokers for that mm. matter, presumably as well? Yeah, it's a mix. I mean, if you think about uh, who, uh, you always ask the question, who does the crime benefit to? Mm. Or something. Uh, 
Um, here is the equity investors. Mm. They are conscious of the dilution. potential dilution and yeah. the advantages of reaching the milestones faster or higher. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're usually the ones coming to us. And so we end up talking to either the VCs mm -hmm. who are also very incented equity investors or founders who have mm -hmm. kept a, quite a significant stake in their business. So a lot of the businesses we finance have a, the founders have a big stake and we like that. OK. Uh, mm -hmm. Because yeah, the owner mindset really, exactly. really makes a big difference. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I no, I think it's really important. I mean, again, I I, I think at some stage I'm going to do a, a bit of an article on venture debt as an asset class on its own because I think it's so important to 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 understand where that sits and and who should be looking for it. And I think more often than not, people don't understand that it is even available, right? Like, because yeah. the European ecosystem is not that mature as far as venture debt is concerned. Is that fair to say? Or, 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 or are there quite a few players out there? It is, uh, it is fair to say that, uh, let's say, uh, the instrument still has a lot of learning. I mean, people have a lot of learning to do uh, on the instrument. Sure. And it's fine. It's, uh, it, but it's at a stage where it's so much more developed than it used to be. Mm. It's not too far away from the US. The US, obviously, is much more diverse mm -hmm. in its offering. You mm -hmm. have... Um, you know, lenders that just focus on life science and you sure. have tons of them. Or you have, you know, the rev-based lending, you know, is, you know, uh, maybe as another scale there, but it's, it's it has come and it has been present in, in Europe as well. Mm. Um, I, it's, it, we see it positively initially, uh, the revenue-based uh, lending. I think what happens over the last few months is the realization that in a downturn, it's a problem. Uh, yeah. the loss ratio might be unexpected for some of those business uh, models. And the cost to the, because obviously if their base rates go up, like their cost their cost of capital has risen, it's gonna be harder for, yeah. well, they're gonna have to pass that on essentially to, yeah, to the business. Yeah, the portion of your fund. revenue, it yeah. becomes yeah. quite. Uh, but but it's, it is, you know, some of them will survive uh, over the cycle and uh, you know uh, new models might be created it, it in, in the pure venture lending which is lending to a technology business that is loss making there is very few ways of lending to those companies that truly work across cycles mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it, i think what's important is not that it, the the instrument works when everything works it's important that the instrument works when you know when things go when wrong things as well wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah and the, the reason why uh let's say you have a little bit of warrants for instance mm. always is because if we were to charge the full interest rate to the the startup they could not service the debt so part of the returns come from, from something that is backloaded mm. and where your lender is incentivized over time to maybe restructure the debt if you're not doing so well for a, a year or two. Because otherwise you lose out both on, on the repayment but also on the potential on the upside. upside of the, of, mm. of the equity. Of mix. the equity. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I think it's that patience in the instrument is, uh, is key. Uh, you, it's something that is less fast paced maybe than you would imagine. Uh, to be a venture lender, you have to have a lot of patience. People calling you is uh, very bad news and, you know, stay calm. <laughs> you got to say, yeah, unlike, yeah. unlike traditional banks, which will obviously like pull the rug from straight under you. In fact, it, it reminds me of my favorite saying at the moment is uh, uh, one that Naval Ravikant, I think, uh, uh, is, is famous for saying or, 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 or did say, but it's playing long term games with long term people. Right. This is yes. it is not a short term kind of stick in some cash that will solve tomorrow it's like you're working in the in very much the same way that the vcs are working long term with their business you are equally mm -hmm. kind of there as partners rather than just providers of of capital right absolutely yeah. absolutely and the way we we build these relationships uh as well with the vcs and the companies is to make sure that it's a repeat business. Yeah. I mean, that's the most fantastic business. In our portfolio, we love to land and land again to the same company. Like the one we mentioned before is maybe the fourth or fifth times that we land Amazing. to them as they grow. Mm. We have this long-term mindset uh, because that's how you build great companies. Yeah. Um, and so as opposed to maybe the, si we, we don't mind that companies use other forms of capital. And I think like, you know, revenue-based lending is great for a certain stage of your growth. Sure. Uh, equity is great for a certain stage. You don't do seed with venture debt yeah. when you don't have like, you know, huge intellectual property or yeah. deep technology. You take that equity risk and you finance it with equity. And as you grow, you diversify. So this is the financial sophistication we would like to see. And we want to contribute in building this in Europe. And also... Um, practice venture debt in a way that I don't know if you, you remember this this turn when equity became much more 
entrepreneur friendly with plain English term sheets and you know 2018 ish mm -hmm. right there was a shift yeah it was all, all a lot of it driven by Y Combinator but yeah like just this founder friendly exactly. uh, environment like, like, which is now turned again but yeah yeah but even now we don't see the type of butcher style environment we would could have expected given the way things are turning out yeah. so everybody's trying to be quite constructive and I think the venture lending DNA we want to bring and that we've been working on is really just that helping them to build long-term successes in Europe. Amazing. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Europe, actually. So you would probably be the first to describe yourselves as underdogs, right? So walk me through how when SVV went under on the 10th of March uh, this year, 2023, you were able to acquire the entire German debt portfolio um, uh, from them and with presumably a lot of established players bidding for it, right? What was that whole process like? And what did it feel like to have come out with, I, I think essentially SVV's whole mainland Europe debt portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, and we're congratulations, of course. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> it was a total. We're, it's a total underdog uh, story, which is uh, it's nice. <laughs> 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 But uh, yeah, so you know, you. I mean, most of the the audience will know that uh, the when SVB went down, uh, the UK portfolio was acquired by HSBC yeah. here. Yeah. Um, in the US, it was acquired by First Citizen Bank, um, and uh, the German piece was still owned by the U.S. regulator. Ah, okay. And so uh, at some point, they auctioned it. Mm. And obviously, to be part of the auction, to be able to uh, act fast, um, you had to be able to price that asset, which is a really a specialist asset. Um, everyone uh, of our peers we know uh, looked and bid for it. Uh, but there was also a few players in Germany that were specialty lenders in Germany that looked into it. We know Deutsche Bank looked into it. So it was a competitive process because um, it's a performing portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, it was quite attractive uh, as an operation. So for so us... So you, uh, you weren't taking on... You weren't taking... So it, it wasn't a risky portfolio. It was a solid portfolio that had been built out by a bank that, as it turned out, was risky in itself. Correct, correct. Their balance sheet had an issue, but yeah. their portfolio didn't. Mm. And, you know, across the globe, uh, the SVB and the people working there are extremely good on the writer. They know what they're doing in the tech space. And that's why they were around for 40 years. Mm, mm. So, uh, so, so the asset, is, it was a quality, it was mature, it was yielding. Uh, so it was a great uh, piece, you know, for us to acquire. And it looks um, like it was coming out of nowhere because the transaction happened in a month. You can imagine, like, it Jesus. was run by <laughs> American in the middle of, uh, I think, uh, Oklahoma, Midwest, yeah, or yeah, yeah. in the Midwest. Well, they thought, okay, in Europe, in the middle of the summer, yeah, no one's gonna <laughs> <laughs> in one month, you have one month to look at thousands like and thousands assets. of uh, <laughs> documents, you know. So anyway, so it was, uh, you know, but anyway, we, di we pulled it off. And uh, but it, we were prepared because we I mean, it's 15 years of us underwriting that asset. So we knew that by heart. Yeah. And like, yeah. so did you see it as like, wow, this is the moment that we could actually just blow up, like just become bigger than you, you'd anticipate or bigger yeah, than you'd anticipate yeah. in the sort of time frame, right? Yeah. Or, or uh, so, so it was a very much like an opportunistic, we can't miss this or we're like, this would be nice to have, but if it doesn't happen, it's fine. No, no, we don't do nice to have. <laughs> 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 no, we, I mean, we had been looking at uh, the German market for a long time it. uh, because it's one of the largest in Europe, right? Mm -hmm. When the American players come, they go UK, France, Germany as the priority and uh, we like the ecosystem. So in the past three, four years, there are more and more B2B businesses coming in uh, with the type of tech DNA we like. Uh, the VC ecosystem is pretty good, you know, with the Lake Stars, the Project A, the headlines. So really great VCs that we would love to work with. Mm. Um, and so we've, we had been already uh, prospecting the market, doing one, two deals. So when, and we knew the assets mm. were still unsold and still owned by the US government. So there was a point it was going to come up. Yeah. Um, so you were prepped. You, so you we, we were prepped yeah. and our team, as we said before, is very multifaceted. Not only I think everybody has done venture debt in there, so we know how to underwrite the asset. 
uh, one of our partners, Elliot, is an ex-SVB. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you're dumped with like thousands of documents, okay, you know where to look. He knows where to look, yeah. Uh, our finance team had done, you know, much bigger things than what we do at Bootstrap, you know, in terms of senior debt underwriting and things like that. So uh, they could mobilize uh, all the analysis for that. Also putting up the funding to acquire the book, right? Mm. Uh, in a month, mm. uh, when everybody's packing that up That was kind of summer. my question, like how the hell do you manage to yeah. do that? Well, n the, our ecosystem at Bootstrap is the companies we finance, the team, but also the investors who yeah, support us. And those have been relationships that we've had mm. for also decades, right? So, yeah. uh, so they were ultra supportive and that allows us to move really fast. Um, and then at the end, I think, uh, because we're always looking for opportunity and we have the expertise to do that, uh, we probably won the bid, um, let's say it, it maybe happened in the last five days Got when it. we understood everyone is bidding on this and you need a very clear differentiation. Mm. Uh, something happened on the FX markets. Uh -huh. So this is buying a dollar um, bid mm. from the US government, mm. but it's Euro loans. So you're also dealing with this multi-currency mm. thing that I think as European, we are better equipped to deal with. Uh, and so, you know, you, there was an arbitrage to do. Yeah, we identified it. I don't think a lot of people did. So you actually mm -hmm. bought at a discount, presumably, in that and case. we split the spoil by yeah. with the seller. So that that put us in a very good position, we gave took, us great uh, returns. We took an edge. Yeah, and so I think, uh, and we split the the, the FX gain or the edge uh, between us and uh, the bidder, so we could bid a higher yeah. bid. And uh, it was a bit technical, but I don't think it would have been possible for a lot of other teams to really identify that as a way to uh, basically pay even less yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> pay them more but offer more pay them more less. And pay, well, yeah. paying yeah. less yeah. 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 because it was so it was so technical and that was really uh, you know possible because of uh, you know the various brains we had around the table I love it that's yeah. so cool uh, yeah. it was really like you know you imagine like when Obama had like the map on the table and we're all strategizing so it was an amazing uh, win for the team and mm -hmm. frankly we really want to leverage that to continue our growth it just is a logical step in our growth story uh, we are on going on to our fourth fund, uh -huh. uh, still doubling down on the pan-European story is UK, Germany, France, Nordics, Netherlands. We're looking at Eastern Europe. And so you have this portfolio, you build those relationships, entrepreneurs, VCs. And I think for us, it's just... Mm. Uh, it was fantastic. And I think us winning the thing was really us, sh uh, you know, showing a little bit or showcasing to the world how agile we can be. I, no. Yeah, I was literally going to say the, yeah. the, the, what sprung, sprung to mind was like a very entrepreneurial thing to Correct. have done in the sense that you obviously small team, agile, innovative, were able to kind of move quickly, figure stuff out on the fly and come with a bit. I mean, it, it, interestingly, here in the UK, the expectation was not that HSBC would win that bid. It was, there were bigger, there were other banks that looked much, much further along in, in the bidding. HSBC came actually as a surprise to everyone. Um, so I like, who knows what happened in that particular mm -hmm. instance. Uh, my, my guess it has something to do with some government inf intervention. Correct. But, um, you know, I, I think what this really showcases is that you're able to kind of very, very quickly proactively react to the circumstances in front of you and yeah like you say yeah it may have been august in 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 europe but you were still kind of at, at your desks putting in the <laughs> putting in the work to get it done right? yeah when people put their boots uh, down or are still running <laughs> <laughs> um yeah yeah i mean it's look for me it's just I, I i can't congratulate you enough i think that's just a massive coup to have to have pulled that off i mean what is your total AUM at the moment, like so with with the portfolio now, what what what, what size is is your total kind of AUM? The funds, mm. the 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 whole AUM uh, that we have is uh, about two hundred and seventy million. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the whole uh, you know AUM at the moment. The the loan book is a very interesting one because it amortizes super fast. Mm -hmm. So basically, a month after we signed, we had you know tens of millions back already Amazing. and so we can recycle, we can recycle because yeah. Yeah, because the done, debt yeah. the, what's important with the debt is your AUM is not your recycling so you invest way more than what you have yeah um, usually at least double as much and yeah. so uh, I was going to say so you leverage two to three times essentially yeah, you, you are using the portfolio yeah. to leverage the portfolio Correct, yeah. correct. And we use the existing cash of the business to finance uh, the yeah. acquisition, if you think about it. And so, yeah, so it's very relative for us in terms of, so our investors are happy. <laughs> but, but it's also, I think, the, the companies, we continue to be strong partners for them. So a third yeah. of them already came back and said, listen, like, can we look at more 
more loans or we're going to grow or we're going to acquire and we're looking to see uh, which one makes sense to see if we can back them and help them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're also dealing with uh, a group of people that know exactly what it means to lend to technology businesses. Mm. 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 Yeah, because um, imagine for the three, four months between uh, 10th of March and when we close the transaction, all these portfolio companies were just in limbo. They were in limbo, yeah. Not they didn't knowing know what, they, who was going to acquire well, them. Well, no, a lot of them assumed that they were just going to have those loans pulled, right? Like, I mean, it, it was a rational kind of decision. Uh, and so a lot of them were scrabbling around trying to figure out if they could essentially either move that debt somewhere else or, yeah. Or, mm. or, yeah. Correct. Yeah, and, and to be frank, you know, SVB had the DNA of supporting entrepreneurs for decades also. Yeah. So finding the same type of partners was not obvious. Yeah. Uh, and they could have ended up with, I don't know if you could, I'm not going to name any German yeah, yeah, sure. bank, but, but yeah. effectively with a bank and a banker who maybe two years uh, down the line is no longer your banker, then what do you do? Well, I mean, essentially... Um, who is it? Barclays is an example here in the UK. Yeah, true. They, they removed their venture debt uh, uh, altogether, I think like two, three years ago. In fact, actually, it was yeah. pre-pandemic maybe, but like, you know, yeah. it suddenly just... And then you're stuck. Stop, right? And then you're stuck, right? Because mm. you can't then go to... It, it's much easier to build on a relationship than you already have mm -hmm. than set up mm -hmm. a new one. Mm -hmm. um, no, look, again, my my sincerest congratulations. I think it's an, an awesome story and, and um, it's so great that you're able to kind of do this. Now... You're both based in different jurisdictions, right? With Fatou in, in Switzerland and Stephanie, you're here in the UK. So what do you see as the main differences in the European, like mainland Europe versus the UK market for venture? And how does that compare? I guess you've talked a little bit about how it compares certainly the venture debt market in, in the US. But what, what do you see as kind of maybe some some main differences or learnings that they could borrow from each other and where things maybe go from here? Mm. Yeah, you know, um, I think now we can't talk uh, too much about the big delay of Europe versus US, or mm. like US is so much ahead. Uh, because Europe has come a long way mm -hmm. in terms of the amount of money raised, like uh, uh, 2021 was a record one. Last year, we were approaching the volumes that are being raised in the US. In, the ve in venture debt specifically? In no, in, in venture in generally. Venture, yeah. Uh, when you look at the IPO market, it's more dynamic in Europe. When yeah. you look at the M&A exit, it's more dynamic in Europe. And so a lot of people would argue that the IPO market might be more dynamic, but is less. Is, it, it, it has less upside than than the US. Like you, 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 you don't see the sort of valuations and and the kind of prevalence the, that tech has given. Yeah, that's true. I mean, when you look past the first effect, like this pop effect of IPOs. Mm. Uh, after the first few days mm. in the US, they also come down. Yeah, sure. Right. So, so you might have less. I mean, some companies wise maybe suffered on European stock exchange, but I think actually have being homegrown and going out here is becoming an easier path compared to okay, you have to go to the US. Yeah, uh, there so is the option at the very least. If not yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and then from the venture debt perspective, what's incredible is that the penetration has decreased mm -hmm. right because the equity grew so fast mm. but the venture that took a little bit more time to grow and so that's why we're like no we need to to keep it to up expand. Yeah. to make sure that we offer the same to european entrepreneurs and the u.s entrepreneurs mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and what do you see kind of UK versus Europe is it, or is it just fairly homogenous so uh, I'm I'm based here and UK is still the largest uh, venture debt market by mm -hmm. far. It's mm -hmm. the more competitive one. It's the more mature one. It's the more uh, penetrated by, you know, all the players, the U.S. players uh, included. Mm -hmm. And it's responsible for about 40 percent, we think, of the wow. of the venture debt market in mm -hmm. Europe. Obviously, France, Germany are coming up, the Scandies always. But uh, but yeah, here is where, you know, things are happening. So, you know, for us, when a few years back we were setting up the team, we thought, okay, we have to be here. We have an office on Old Street. So we have to be in the middle of where the action is happening. Mm. Uh, because a lot of VCs cover also uh, from the UK, the rest, the rest yeah, of Europe. Yeah, the rest mm. of Europe. Yeah, the yeah. rest of Europe, yeah. yeah. And but a lot of US, yeah. a lot of US VCs set up shop again in, in London, UK, in London. but mm. with a Europe mandate. Because yeah. of the language. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, you know, what's interesting is for us, we really think that successful company, they will want to move everywhere in Europe, mm. right? So working with, uh, you know, lenders that have a more international mindset rather than the local mindset is important. So that's why for us, we always have a foot everywhere in, where we can be in Europe. Uh, yeah, just to, to make sure that we can also structure, you know, sometimes when you have like different entities across geographies, uh, we're good at structuring those. Yeah, and it's that like, I, I mean, I always say when we're working with, with ventures, like that local knowledge is super important, right? Like you can expand into a new geography mm -hmm. 
I, and I've seen this happen before, right? Ex especially, let's say, Europe to US expansion. The assumption is, oh, I can just start selling in the US. No, you need boots. So in the US. You're, not, you're not selling in the US. You're selling in a state yeah. mm. in the US and possibly within that state. You're selling in a city in that state in the US and like mm. everywhere else that you go is different. Yeah. Um, and I think that the importance of that localization can't be underestimated. And again, like, especially when you're dealing with debt products, right? You need to have... You, you need to understand what the local conditions are like. You need to understand what the foreign mm. exchange controls are like. You need to understand, mm. I mean, obviously in, in Western Europe, that isn't as big a, a, a big a problem, if a problem at all. But um, if you don't understand what's happening on the ground, you could end up making decisions that, that potentially uh, uh, have negative consequences, right? For the fund. Yeah, yeah, you get the tourists welcome, right? You yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's happened to a couple of people I know, uh, came and changed some money in, uh, in Leicester Square. And I sort of said, you should have <laughs> just asked me, but you know, they kind of lost about, I think 20% of what, what, what they should have earned. Um, but listen, Fatou and Stephanie, it's been absolutely wonderful having you here in the studio with me. For our audience, um, where's the best place for them to find you online? Are you on LinkedIn? Are you on Twitter? Where, where's the best place for them to come looking for you? I guess LinkedIn is a, mm. is a pretty safe bet. Uh, we're on Twitter, but mostly to support our portfolio companies. So find us on LinkedIn and Medium. Amazing. Um, for the meantime, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a, a real pleasure. Thank yes, you so much. Thanks for thank the invitation. So much, <laughs> Amazing. And, and the great questions. And also for having like come all the way from Switzerland. It's, uh, <laughs> it's incredible. Thank you so much. I really thank appreciate you. it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.